This video is brought to you by Nebula. It's not exactly been a great year for the Conservatives. They went into 2024 a staggering 20 points behind in the polls. They lost the election and secured the lowest number of seats in their history, and they're now in the midst of what could turn out to be a bruising leadership election. Seemingly dismayed by all of this, right-wing voters in the UK have started switching their allegiance to the insurgent upstart Reform UK party. Despite only being a few years old, Reform UK managed to secure 4.1 million votes in the election, only 2.7 million behind the Conservatives. However, because of the UK's first-past-the-post voting system, Reform UK was awarded only five MPs. Nonetheless, though, this is an impressively meteoric rise and contrasts with the swift decline of the Conservatives. In the immediate aftermath of the election, speculation started about the possibility of Reform UK providing more opposition to Labour than the Tories, owing to their respective strength. So, with the election now firmly in the rearview mirror, let's have a look at whether this is actually happening. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Now, it's worth starting the video by explaining that the impact of Reform UK is not simply limited to their seats in Parliament. Even now, they're maintaining their support in the polls. The most recent voting intention poll from BMG Research puts Reform UK on 19%, with the Conservatives on 26%. Additionally, polling from Arden Strategies recently found that, among Labour voters, more people would rather vote Reform UK than the Conservatives, by a pretty large margin. Now, obviously, the Liberal Democrats were the most popular second-choice party. However, the fact that 14% of Labour voters had Reform down as their second choice, and only 6% had the Conservatives down, it's further evidence that Farage is in a very good position to act as the main opposition to Starmer's Labour. Additionally, with a net favourability rating of minus 50%, Reform UK are actually more popular than the Conservatives, who have a net favourability rating of minus 70%. Now, again, it's worth mentioning a couple of caveats here. Labour, Plaid Cymru, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens are all more popular. However, as they're all nominally left of centre, they're not in a position to represent those on the right of the country and provide proper opposition to a Labour government. So it's clear that there is, at least an argument, that Reform UK might be in a better position than the Conservatives to oppose Labour. The question is though, are Reform providing this opposition? Well, there are some recent examples of this being the case. The best one is the recent decision by the Labour government to press ahead with a ban on outdoor smoking. As with many substantive policy matters these days, the Conservative Party just didn't have a unified line on this. It was only a couple of months ago that they were campaigning, under former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, on a manifesto that promised to ban smoking not just outdoors, but everywhere for anyone born on or after the 1st of January 2009. And even earlier than this, they actually voted on the bill as it was passing through Parliament. Whilst every Labour MP voted in favour, 57 Tory MPs voted against, including current Tory leadership candidate Kemi Badenoch. This then makes opposing Labour's legislation right now quite hard, as they previously tried to do something similar and demonstrated their disunity in the process. Reform UK, on the other hand, just doesn't have this problem. Nigel Farage was very clear in both instances that he didn't agree with the ban, calling Sunak's proposal moronic and claiming that Starmer's proposal would kill off the traditional pub forever. In essence, Farage is able to provide significantly better opposition here to Labour for three reasons. The first is that his party is smaller and easier to control, meaning there's fewer rogue MPs within the party looking to step out of line. The second is that Farage is popular, and therefore few of his members and MPs feel that they should, or even could, successfully move against him on policy matters, giving him much more power and ability to enforce discipline. Third, and most importantly though, Reform UK is not composed of multiple different factions, as the larger parties, like Labour and the Conservatives are. When they're in power and have large majorities, Labour and the Tories are generally able to keep their factionalism at bay. After all, these parties exist to achieve power, and it's hard to argue that the leader is failing when they have a large majority. However, it's been obvious for a while that the Conservatives have been on the cusp of losing power, and were soon to be in opposition for at least the next five years. 
As such, even while they were technically still in power, the Conservative government was beset by intense factionalism. As such, it was, and still is, hard for them to decide where they stand on things. A section of the party still backs Liz Truss and her libertarian budget. Others reject this entirely, and back a more David Cameron-esque style of politics known as One Nationism. And, well, this factionalism is even worse now that they're in the middle of a protracted leadership election. It's worth reiterating though, this simply isn't an issue for Reform UK. It doesn't try to be a broad church of opinion. They've been very clear that they're trying to be a home for those on the right in the UK, and more specifically, the right of the Conservative Party. Now, obviously, the cigarette ban is only one example of Farage managing to provide opposition where the Conservatives haven't. But this is only a very new parliament, and one that's been on recess for more days than it's been sitting. If the dynamic doesn't change soon, then it's entirely possible that Reform UK could be expected to provide the bulk of opposition to Starmer's government. As things stand, the Conservative leadership election is set to conclude on the 2nd of November. It's possible that the new leader stamps their authority on the party and gets them in line, but to be blunt, this seems unlikely. It seems far more likely that each Tory faction will likely continue to blame each other for their current predicament, making providing effective opposition nearly impossible. Now, to an extent, this is actually already happening. Tory leadership candidate Tom Tugendhat launched his bid this week by claiming that the Conservatives are no longer taken seriously by voters, and that he saw duty give way to ego. No doubt a thinly veiled swipe at Liz Truss. Anyway, we'll have to see over the next few months whether the Tories are able to pull back together, and if not, whether Reform UK steps in to provide opposition to Starmer's Labour. Now, that's not all. We've actually got a new series called WTF USA, and you can watch the trailer right here. Look, as British people, we often cast a wary eye at our friends across the Atlantic. But honestly, the last few months have been especially wild. We've seen Biden bail from the race after a terrible debate. My fellow Americans. The red-blue divide making way for lurid green. Trump accusing Kamala of changing her race. Vance getting accused of couches, endless memes about coconut trees, and endless arguments over crowd sizes. This weird obsession with crowd sizes. Obama making a <laughs> joke, Trump talking about Biden like an ex he misses, RFK Jr. potentially having worms in his brain before admitting to burying a bear in Central Park. Oh, and an assassination attempt that we all kind of forgot about because of all of the other chaos. I mean, honestly, WTF USA. The thing is though, while it might be tempting to just roll your eyes at these shenanigans, these aren't just meme-worthy moments. And you know I'm serious because I've not stood up in a video since COVID, but these incidents actually pose important questions. Like how much does the Gen Z vote matter this time round? How important will online campaigning and social media prove to be? What impact do running mates have? <laughs> okay, I don't have words for that one. These are the kinds of things we'll be explaining in our new Nebula original series, What to Follow USA, only on Nebula. Each week, we'll take the moments that have been dominating internet discourse and explaining the true politics under the hood. Look at me pandering to the American audience. We'll be releasing new episodes of What to Follow every Friday through to the election. The fact that it's on Nebula means we've been able to take more risks with this series. The tone and attitude of the show isn't what you'd expect from TLDR. I'm not sure we've talked about fucking couches on YouTube before, but the journalism and reporting is exactly the standard you'd expect. Nebula support also means that we can do things differently, create additional content for you, and tackle topics that the YouTube algorithm just wouldn't normally allow for. It's not just this new series on Nebula either though. There's also incredible originals on the platform like Modern Conflicts from Real Life Law, or the upcoming documentary from Tom Nicholas, Boomers, which takes a provocative look at the lives and legacy of the baby boom generation. Plus, we also post all of our normal content on Nebula ad-free, and often before it ends up on YouTube. If you want to check all of that out, plus WTF USA, then head to go.nebula.tv forward slash WTF, or click the link in the description. That way, you can pick up an annual Nebula subscription for a huge 40% off. We're really happy with how this new series has turned out, so please do give the series a look. We'd really appreciate it.